Hey, what's up? This is the Flyover Libertarian, where three unimportant people from an unimportant place give you the opinion that you didn't ask for. I'm Josh, aka Iowa and Cap. And I am Darren Belly, and today we are joined by Jimmy Song, who might actually be important. Uh, Jimmy Song is the author of Programming Bitcoin and uh, co author of the Little Bitcoin book, and Thank God for Bitcoin. And today, we have uh, invited him on, and he's, he has graciously accepted um, to talk about Thank God for Bitcoin, uh, talking about the moral case for Bitcoin in a Christian context. Um, Jimmy Song is also the host of the Bitcoin Fixes This podcast. And uh, Jimmy, we would just like to start off with, um, give us the, uh, the overview of the book, uh, where the book came from, what the authors are trying to say, and what the church needs to hear about it. Yeah, so we we got together the eight of us uh, as a result of the pandemic. A little bit, uh, we we were stuck at home, and I we wanted to do some sort of like Bitcoin bi- uh, Bible study or something like that. So we studied a bunch of passages, decided it was working. So we invited some more people, and uh, and we wanted to study um, money from more of a moral perspective and. We ended up doing two books, um, The Ethics of Money, production by Jörg Rito Halsman, and Honest Money by Gary North. So after studying both books, uh, we liked them very much, but at the end, we were just kind of like, you know, the endings of both these books are quite depressing because uh, basically what both books say is, you know, the current system is horribly corrupt. Uh, so we need to go back to the gold standard. And the way we get back to the gold standard is to get a political action committee together and to inform lots of people so we can overturn like a hundred years of being on, you know, having a central bank and things like that, which, you know, like for most people that read the book, they're kind of like, yeah, that's not really going to happen. There's, <laughs> there's no way that that's going to happen. And we wanted to have a message of hope and we knew uh, that Bitcoin was that message. So we decided to write the book um, to you know, give Christians the argument about what it is that money actually is and to think of money production and, um, you know, the money that we use as a moral choice that we're making. Um, so we, we worked on it. We, uh, we, did, uh, we do make the case for Bitcoin. But for the first seven chapters, um, you know, we, we got a lot of material out of those two books. And it, it's really... I would say chapter one is more like the theology of money, what money actually is and how it represents our labor and sort of promises of the future, how it relates to the biblical principle of sowing and reaping. Um, Then we get into chapter two, which is much more about the history of money, how we got to the point that we were, uh, you know, we're using fiat money more or less. Um, Then chapter three and chapter four describe, uh, you know, inflation and fiat money and how evil those things can be. And then we discuss sort of the consequences uh, to society, politically speaking, um, then at the individual level, and finally uh, at the church, uh, like to the church, how how it affects the church. Um, And then finally, we, we talk about Bitcoin and how it fixes all of the ills that we see. And we can definitely talk about all of that. But that's basically the, uh, the structure that we lay out is that the current system is a complete cesspool of theft, corruption, and cronyism, uh, where uh, Bitcoin um, it doesn't have a central authority or a money printer and is therefore much more more. Well, just I'll throw my cards on the table. I, I'm the Bitcoin normie. Uh, I don't know a ton about this magical uh, internet money. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested. But uh, I just I don't know a ton about it. So what are some of the uh, I guess just because I am the, the common Christian normie on this point, um, what are some of the if you got like an elevator pitch for Bitcoin, what kind of thing would you tell me? Besides read your book, uh, let's start with what uh, what money is, because uh, and this is why we start the book this way. Most people know what you can do with money, right? Like you can go get a loan, Uh, you can maybe buy something with it, you can, um, you know, purchase some goods or services and whatever. Um, That's what they know. They don't actually know what money represents or how it is really stored value that you have from the community, um, how it belongs to the community and so on. So um, 
talking about that and uh, talking through what it should be uh, is an important part. And then talking about the actual way that the monetary system currently works. Um, essentially, it's uh, the current system is a debt-based system. Um, so everything can be had right now um, as long as you're enslaved for like the next, uh, you know, however long that you have to pay back the loan. Um, this is uh, like completely the opposite of sort of the biblical model, which is one of sowing and reaping. The one that sows reaps, right? Like the, the idea is that you save and prepare and, and then get the reward at the end. This is the godly model. Um, instead, we've reversed this model with fiat money. Um, and it's no wonder that at every level, individual, company, government, everybody is up to their eyeballs in debt because that's the way the system works. It's essentially you getting what you want right now, and then you're enslaved for some period of time. And as Proverbs says, debtor is servant to the lender. You end up being a servant to whoever you owe the money to. So that's the current system. And the current system is especially nefarious because uh, all of that debt comes from nothing. Um, so when you, when, for example, you get a, a mortgage for your house, say it's like $250,000 loan that you get from the bank, it isn't that somebody on the other side is willing to lend $250,000 at 3% interest rate over 30 years. Um, if you're an investor, you would think, hey, that's not a very good return. And you're right. Uh, there's nobody that's willing to be on that other side of that trade. What they do is they print that money out of thin air for, on your behalf. In fact, there's no risk at all to the bank. Because what they end up doing is getting that mortgage insured by Fannie and Freddie. And, uh, and it is for this reason that if you meet a certain set of qualifications, you will always get approved for that loan. As long as you have a high enough credit score and you have uh, enough income and can prove it, those are, the, those are the restrictions. And then they can get that mortgage insured by Fannie and Freddie, at which point they have zero risk. Even if you default on the loan, they will make up for it. That's, that's how the system is set up. But that money is printed on your behalf, right? Like that money didn't exist. There's nobody on the other side lending out and foregoing their chance at doing something with $250,000. It's money printed for your sake. Now, obviously, you're benefiting as a result of getting that mortgage, and the bank is benefiting because they are getting interest. But who's it actually hurting? And this is the part that a lot of people miss. And this is where economics comes into play, which is who's it hurting? Well, the person it's hurting is everybody else that has saved money in dollars because their dollars are being um, devalued through the monetary expansion of the small bit of a quarter million dollars that has come into the economy. And it's not just uh, you know, people that are holding dollars in a bank or something, it's people that are holding cash and, and so on. And, it, and that's definitely not just people in the United States. It's central banks in other countries. It's people that are holding dollars that are in countries that have very terrible currencies. So people in Nigeria, people in Turkey, people in Zimbabwe, people in Venezuela, people in North Korea. These are all people that are holding dollars. You are essentially stealing from them. And this is the key is that from a moral perspective, all of that money that is being printed is being taken from everybody else that is holding it. And, and we're culpable in it because we're, we, we are getting loans that are printed out of nothing. Um, companies are culpable in it because they're able to issue bonds, uh, which are essentially printed money, um, so that they can, they can get um, uh, you know, these loans that, that, uh, and steal from everybody else. Governments are doing it when they run these large deficits. They're, they're able to spend that money that doesn't, didn't exist before, and they're uh, you know, devaluing everybody else's money. Uh, and ultimately, that's theft. And you know, Eighth Commandment, right? Thou shalt not steal. It's a pretty plain and simple way to look at it. And, uh, and honestly, it's, uh, it's something that the church hasn't addressed almost in any way so far. Um, there are some Older authors like Nicolas Oresme, Nicole Oresme, who's a French bishop from the 14th century that, that, that was speaking about all of this. And a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Spanish monks that, that were examining, exa uh, you know, the effects of monetary expansion and so on. Um, but there, there's, there's a lot of this that the church just does not speak about at all. So that's what I would say to sort of like a normal Christian that hasn't thought too much about money is that really 
when you're participating in this system through loans and so on, what you're actually doing is stealing from some of the poorest people in the world, some of the most desperate people in the world, the, the, the people in Venezuela and the people in North Korea that, that want dollars because their, uh, their local currency is that bad. Um, and you're stealing from that. I mean, that that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting uh, approach of looking at the debt angle because you think about how many people in our churches have gone through like a Dave Ramsey program where they're like, all right, no debt, no debt, no debt. And then like, all right, yeah, now apply that to the whole monetary system. Like this, we <laughs> live in a world based on entirely on debt. And you can see why if it's not going to work for your house, it's not going to work for the country. Yeah, and it's not going to work for anybody, really. But, you know, the reason why governments do all of this and why individuals do this and companies do this, why at every level everyone is doing this is because ultimately they just uh, they want something now. Right. They, they want to upend the principle of sowing and reaping. God created a world where you're supposed to work for something and get something at the end. And I, I noticed that you, you, you have a, a, a child there. Like if you're teaching your child, hey, like, uh, like, what would you do? Would you give them the toy first and then make them pay it off over a week? Or would you make them save up for a week and then get it at the end? Like clearly the latter is more character building and God made the world that way. And we're sort of upending and changing everything by uh, putting, uh, you know, bringing forward consumption and being willing slaves in a way. Um, and that's unfortunately the entire system, and it's uh, it's corrupted our character, it's corrupted our politics, it's corrupted our churches, um, and it's something that we really need to desperately look at and fix because it's it's a it's a sin that um, that sort of is like cast aside, and no one that no and no one is really talking about it because, in a sense, we're all complicit in. How much luck have you had in talking to church members as individuals, but also churches as institutions in, in getting people to just first understand what you're saying and then to start to agree and move in that direction? Yeah, so, I mean, the, that conviction came as part of writing the book. And, uh, you know, uh, the eight of us while writing it, you know, we would discuss a lot of this stuff. And, uh, and really, it was during that study that we were like, you know what, I think all loans are theft like oh my goodness we're, we're all sinning like by taking out mortgages and stuff um so it, that was during the pandemic like i said and uh you know most of us haven't been able to like go in and out of churches like it it you know it's all messed up pretty much everywhere um so it, it's not something that we've had the opportunity to go and talk to our churches about um, I've certainly talked to individuals about it, and if if I lay out the case for them, they're like, "Yeah, you're right. Like that's so obvious. I can't believe I've never thought of that, and I didn't know that's how money worked." Uh, but you know, I, I show them it's like, "Yeah, it doesn't make sense that anyone would invest two hundred fifty thousand dollars over thirty years at three percent and have like the risk of default. Like no one would ever do that. Like there's no way you would need way higher interest rate for to do that." And they're like, "Yeah, you're right. Then how does it work?" <laughs> and it, it, it's it becomes pretty obvious to them, um, but you know that that conviction of uh, you know are are we re really stealing from all of these like really poor people? That's not, um, you know it's it's I it's a message that really does need to get out to the church, and I, I I thank you guys that you're you're having me on your podcast so we can we can talk about these things. But it's um, it's not something that a lot of churches are aware of, uh, uh, like how just how corrupting this monetary system is to our souls and to our character and to our churches. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to speak more to that and hopefully like, um, you know, get invited on more podcasts like this so I could go and, uh, and speak the truth about this. Yeah. I was, I, I, that's, that's one of the things that um, the more you realize the far reaching implications of, of the fed and of money printing, it's one of those things that, like, at first, I was, like, when I first became a libertarian, I came in and heard everyone constantly talking about the Fed. I'm like, y'all talking about banks? I feel like that's, that's the nerdiest thing to talk about. Like, is that really what we're going to make our thing? But then you, you sit in the room and you, you find out how far-reaching that corruption goes. Like, like, it's so hard to teach the, the Christian discipline of patience or the Christian virtue of patience in a world that is, 
that is is literally like this or or people talk about how terrible consumerism is yeah well where does this consumerist attitude come from like this comes from uh this fiat based currency you know this fiat based society and 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 it is yeah like like there it's it's a bad uh it, it, they've made it a bad how do, how do i say this a bad investment to save like the thing that we should be doing that makes a stable society thinking to the future they've made it a bad investment and and you're right that's such a corrupting thing it's going to affect everything not just money but the way we live our lives and and whether or not we start families yeah it, it should be you know sowing and reaping right mm -hmm. like but it's it's uneconomical to sow right now yeah. because if you if you try to say first of all it's a lot of work right like if you're if you're going to invest at all, you have to research like hundreds of stock. If you're real investing in real estate, you have to like research tons of properties. And it's like work that isn't producing anything. It's just work doing research. It's not going to get reused necessarily by anybody. Um, and everyone does their own research anyway. So like if you know anybody that's rich, this is what they spend all their time doing is keeping their money. It's like I've made like a you know hundred million dollars. Now I'm gonna make sure I keep it. So like their their full time job is making sure that their hundred million dollars doesn't degrade, and they they have to continue investing and, and and figuring out where to put their money. These are people that earned a hundred million dollars, right? Like they could be going out the out into the market creating goods and services. Instead, they're they're like basically running on a treadmill to stay stay in the same place. It's it's kind of a horrible situation. Um, and th this is the corruption of fiat money is that. When, when there is a money printer, they force everybody to keep running in place. That, 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 that's part of the deal is if, you, if you're not running in place, well, then we're going to screw you over. Um, and that, that's happened to a lot of people. Um, if, if, you're, if you're not careful with your money and continuously researching and investing and so on, it's all wasted work. Uh, instead of creating goods and services for uh, you know, uh, you know, your fellow human beings, which I believe to be, you know, loving your fellow man, right? Like this is this is loving others as yourself is creating goods and services that they need, right? Like the, the, that's the that's one of the verses that I really like from Ephesians is he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who is. It's all about doing something that the market wants so that you can contribute something uh, that they can't necessarily provide themselves, but you have the talent to do. And, and this is what money allows is for you to figure out where in the economy, where in civilization, where in society that you can contribute the most, where it will make the most impact. Because the price is a signal about, you know, the impact that you're making. And if you're getting paid more for it, that means that people are more uh, in need of that particular good or service. But when money is corrupted, all of this goes out of balance and it's no longer a signal about what, what other people need or want. It becomes instead how close it is to the money printer. And that in turn means it's, uh, you know, there, there's this giant uh, sucking uh, uh, of resources into um, the cronies of the money printer. And, uh, and you know, that, that's what it indicates more now in a... Uh, a um, debt-based central bank fiat system uh and that that's where a lot of money tends to go is you know investment banking or you know um things of that nature where it, it, you're not really necessarily providing value it's all about being close to the money printer so you can make lots of money yeah so how does bitcoin fix this because i i'm also looking from the perspective of 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 normal christians and we're just looking at it like okay so this this digital money how is that uh, a solution yeah yeah so the key is that uh and that we we lay this out pretty well i think in uh in chapter eight of the book uh but here here are the properties of bitcoin that make it especially good for fixing a lot of this stuff um, it is uncensorable, so there's no third party, right? That's in the middle that that's uh, preventing you from doing certain transactions. There's no money printer, right? There's no no central authority that gets to decide how much of a particular unit there, uh, uh, how many units of the money there is. It will always be 21 million, and it's programmatic. Um, it's uh, it, it's unseizable, so meaning that if you possess it, 
Um, it's not like uh, gold where, you know, in 1933, um, FDR um, gave Executive Order 6102 seizing all gold from individuals, right? Um, you can't really do that with Bitcoin. You could try, but it's, uh, it doesn't have a physical place, right, like gold does. So, uh, you know, you could back it up, you could keep it in your brain, you could keep it encoded on, you know, a piece of paper, you know, it does it. There are many ways to store it and, uh, and you don't necessarily have to give it up. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's, it gives you property rights over, uh, you can have property rights over Bitcoin that are much stronger than you can have property rights over something physical. And, uh, and in that way, um, it makes it very difficult to, for the government to just come in and take it. Um, and as a result of all of that, because there's, it, it's decentralized, there's no, it, it's hard to seize, it's, uh, it's uncensorable, there's no like, uh, in-between party that, that, that'll say, well, you can't do that. Um, it gives people a lot more freedom. Um, and ultimately, that means that the market will work a lot better uh, because there's nobody in the middle that uh, forces one thing or the other. Uh, instead, everything is done voluntarily and so on. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, you don't have these cheap loans that bring forward consumption. Uh, instead, if you want to get loans, you have to actually go out into the market and get them at the, at, at the rates that they are. Um, you know, there's pretty good evidence that the normal rate of interest should be 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 percent and not the 2, 3 percent that we're seeing or even negative interest rates that you see in Europe. Um, so if, if it's not like that, then people will generally tend to save a lot more. And if you're saving, uh, then you're, you're, you know, in line with sort of God's design for the world, which is sowing and reaping. And if you, uh, a lot more people will uh you know not they won't be spending so frivolously they'll be saving they'll be um thinking long term they'll have the christian virtue of patience or um you know what we in bitcoin call low time preference behavior um you know planning for the future being wiser with their money um and th this is behavior that's rewarded in a bitcoin system which uh, whereas it's punished in a fiat system so uh, all of that, I think, uh, leads down to, you know, people doing stuff like, um, you know, having bigger families. Like, um, you know, one of the things that we point out in the book is, you know, if you ask a, a, a couple that doesn't have kids yet, hey, wh uh, why don't you have kids yet? And, you know, the almost the immediate answer is because we can't afford it. So what are you actually telling me? That if you had money, that the money would take care of the kid? what are you putting your faith in, right? Where, where is your, like, you don't trust God, you, tr you trust money? Is that what you're saying to me? Um, and that, that's a, it's a subtle worship of money that we have as a result of what we call the, uh, the monetary Stockholm syndrome, that which enslaves us, we become sort of like attached to and start worshiping. Um, and that, that, that's what money, that, this current system of money has done. Uh, it, instead, once we go to Bitcoin, I think we, we have a sound, hard money. And you, you, there, there is this, um, you know, sowing and reaping that is justly rewarded instead of unjustly punished like we, we are in the current system, uh, which means that, you know, instead of, you know, worrying necessarily about money or putting so much stock in, in, in money as a way to, like, um, you know, uh, secure our future, we could trust God more. And, and instead of putting money on too high a pedestal or too low um, a, a contempt, which Christians tend to do, they often do both, by the way, which is kind of crazy to me, like at church, you know, or, you know, in small group or whatever, they, everyone will deny like to the gills that they don't actually care about money, but you watch their behavior and it, it, they care about money a great deal. Um, and like it's, it's, you, you can't place money too high or too low, right? Like it, it's meant to be a tool for us um, to, uh, to do God's will. And it, you're not supposed to worship it. You're supposed to put it in its right place. It ha it, it, it's supposed to be something that we're using to uh, fulfill God's purpose for our lives and do, you know, uh, do what he wants us to do. Um, but at the same time, like we're we're not supposed to like think so much of it that it'll solve everything. Um, and I, I think Bitcoin does that. And I, I've seen evidence with a lot of Bitcoiners, uh, uh, those of us that wrote the book, 
have noticed changes in our lives, right? In our behavior and how we think about things, how we think about kids, how we think about family, how we think about church, how we think about friends. All of that changes because money is no longer our God. And that's ultimately what we're talking about is uh, when, when you do place, um, you know, mu- uh, when, when we have the fiat system, it really does force us to worship it and, you know, spend all this time saving it or earning it or, um, you know, keeping it or whatever. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin takes us away from that into the other things that God wants to bless us with. I have to say, I have seen that in my own life as well. Um, particularly with the house that um, my wife and I own right now, we bought this house before I had even heard of Bitcoin. And I was the one who introduced my wife to it. Um, and now I'm like, I don't know if I'm comfortable owning because I have a mortgage. Like, it is it is forcing me to consider the moral implications of my previous financial decisions, as well as the conversation about children, um, where we're like, well, you know, we're we're getting to that point where we think we, well, a couple of years ago we would have said we would have had enough, but now we're like, well, we're kind of liking this. Children, we're really starting to see that children are a blessing, as well as they're a blessing on on the on the timeline of our lives where it's it's forcing us to lower our time preference on that and we are really considering the long-term blessing yes there are sleepless nights yes there's a lot of money involved but um the 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 blessing and as well as you know the submission to um god in just in having and raising children um we're we're more and more thinking that uh you know, we're not just going to stop. This is this is something that's good, and we'll continue with it. This idea of family planning is an anathema. It's uh, it's saying I'm going to be in control of how many kids I have instead of God. Um, and and to me, it's uh it, it it's um it's a very narcissistic point of view. And this is one of the subtle things that fiat money um, has you do is it makes you just sort of focus on yourself instead of other people. Um, and you know, when, when you have sound money, it's much easier to focus on other people because that's how you make money. Instead, like if you're, if you're looking for rent seeking opportunities or something, you're necessarily going to be narcissistic because you, you have to look out your, uh, for yourself. So yeah, I, I, I do think that, uh, I, I have noticed this, um, trend among Bitcoiners that we tend to have a lot of kids. I myself have six. Um, there are other uh, families that I know that have a lot of kids. Uh, a lot of them are planning to have a lot more kids. And, uh, you know, it's similar at church, right? The, you know, I think the average uh, churchgoer, if, if they're attending service every week, has like on average three kids, whereas the U.S. average is something like 1.8. Um, so there, there's something, something to be said about low time preference behavior and having lots of kids that are probably pretty correlated. So yeah, it it does change your perspective. It does change your outlook and it does sort of make you more obedient to God. So I think it's a very good thing to, uh, you know, take this, uh, this, uh, you know, evil of fiat money away by opting out and, you know, getting into Bitcoin. Hey, Ro Rothbard here. If you're enjoying this riveting discussion about family planning, then you need to subscribe to our mailing list at flyover.page. Also check us out on Twitter at Rural Rothbard, at IOANCAP, at Darabelli. Thanks. If a church wanted to go on to some form of a Bitcoin standard, um, would it be able to do it right now, particularly in America, um, in the larger fiat economy that we have? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not, I, and, and I'm not sure I have the answers on that, but I will say though, that I, I think it, it's wrong for churches to just take out these giant mortgages. Um, you know, most of them say, you know, they're doing it in faith, right? Like that they'll, they'll build a building that's like, uh, three times the size of their current congregation, uh, because the bank will loan them money as long as they show church receipts or whatever. Um, and then they become sort of servants to the bank because, you know, it, it's all about getting that revenue up um, and it's all about growing. Um, so, you know, they don't say unpopular things, right? It's always about being super nice. And this is, this is where I think we get this church culture of being super nice. Like, uh, I, 
I heard a preacher say like the 11th commandment is thou shalt be nice. I'm just kidding. But that's how Christians act, right? Like that, like that, that niceness is a strategy to get more people to pay, to be in the church. And that, at, at least in my reading of scripture, that that's not something that Jesus necessarily did. I, he was, he was very gracious and generous to the poor and downtrodden that, that were hungry for him and he would reach out to them and that that uh, that's part of it but he he's also the guy that flipped tables in the temple and that like called the pharisees brood of vipers and like you know like ab- absolutely like get thee behind me satan like he wasn't necessarily like nice all the time which is uh, which is unfortunately like sort of the culture of the church but i i think that's part of the fiat disease it's it's part of the strategy that a lot of churches are forced into because of these giant buildings because of these giant mortgage payments that they have to make um and if if they're not necessarily nice you you start losing people it's kind of like um you know a a religious country club or something you you and it's run kind of like that as a business instead of as a separate people of god as a as a holy people of god that are all seeking to you know do his will instead it becomes all right let's get as many people in here as possible and you know guide them towards uh you know doing um you know <laughs> getting these uh payments uh, down or whatever um i i honestly have not seen many churches that that started growing as a result of a building like end up in a really good place like almost all of them like have financial problems usually like the money causes some sort of split or a lot a bunch of people leave and things like that i i think there's a reason for that like there it, it's it's because you know the money becomes the master and it's um uh so all right so to answer your question what can churches do how, how what how do like what's a practical thing that they can do first of all instead of like desperately trying to get a building you know, save up, right? Like this is the principle of sowing and reaping. And, you know, you, you sow by, you know, saving up and and like spending less than you're collecting, right? Like on on pastor salaries and stuff. Uh, Almost every church that I've been at, like they, they almost always just like spend way too much money compared to the, the money that they're receiving. And, Maybe they own the building, so they're okay with the deficit because they get an, a, a line of credit on their building or something like that. It's it, that to me is an anathema. Like, like churches should be like uh, constrained by normal economic constraints as anybody else. Um, and you know, if if you're losing congregants or you're, you're con- maybe your congregation should congregation should be smaller. That's okay. And you know, God's the you know Jesus only spent time with like 12 people and like he that they did fine right like you don't need 1500 people every sunday in order for your church to be considered successful jesus did it with 11 uh, uh like well 12 minus one right so you know like it, it's it's fine to do that and uh and you know sowing reaping and like not necessarily counting the number of members or tithing members as your measure of success but fulfilling god's will um, that said, if they are saving, you know, I think you like the U.S. dollar is a melting ice cube, as Michael Saylor has uh, described it. Um, you know, like finding good investments and having maybe some portion of it in Bitcoin might make sense if you are saving for, you know, some future uh, ministry opportunities and things like that. I, I think that's a very, you know, natural way in which uh, Bitcoin can get involved in there. Uh, but I mean, like the the way that the current church system works it's it's much more like a religious country club business than it is the body of christ and that's something that i really wish would change yeah definitely i i like uh, i always love it that um jesus at the zenith of his popularity he's got a large crowd in front of him just fed them all and uh then they come running for him across the river and then he's like all right here's the deal guys you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> it just runs them out with this old, really weird metaphor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Go on. No, no, and, and that that's absolutely correct. And the thing is, like, you look at the Old Testament prophets and stuff like that. They 
they didn't say some popular things, right? Like, uh, uh, almost all of them to a man were, like, condemned and, like, just everybody hated them. Um, you know, the early church, too, they, they would go and say things that were extremely unpopular to the culture. Um, instead, what, I, what I'm seeing with the church right now is they want to embrace the culture. They, they almost want, um, you know, like the world to say, oh, you, you're, you guys are all right. You know, like that to me is, is the exact opposite of what I see in scripture. Like if, if somebody doesn't hate you for loving Christ, then you're probably doing something wrong. And, you know, I, I, I just don't see this courage or boldness or, um, you know, spirit of, uh, of conviction that I, I would expect, uh, you know, reading scripture that, uh, and it's, it's kind of a sad commentary, but that's, that, uh, yeah, and it's probably fairly harsh. And, you know, I, I admit that, uh, but yeah, you know, like, what can we do? Gotta, you know, be perfect for I, uh, because I am perfect. Like you're, you're, we're supposed to strive and I, I don't see much striving right now. Um, one thing that I'm, I'm often wondering about is like like uh like he he mentioned, uh we live in a fiat world and and we'd love to see the world go to a sound money world and so I guess the the question is like so how do we live halfway point you know like in in the halfway point where we're in where we want to start adopting um not just sound money print uh lifestyles but sound money like Bitcoin and yet places don't we're don't take Bitcoin as payment, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's okay. You don't, you don't need them to take it as payment. Um, you know, the, when's the last time you paid somebody with gold, right? Like as long as it wor uh, works as a good savings vehicle, you can always put, put money into that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, where your heart is there, or where your treasure is there, your heart will be also, or the other way around. I can't remember, but you know, that, that's the idea is that, you know, you, you, as long as you're storing value in Bitcoin, like the rest of it can, will work itself out. You don't necessarily need to uh, pay directly with Bitcoin, although there are plenty of places that you can do that with. Um, but, you know, having this as a savings vehicle um, gives us an out. And that, that's, the, that's sort of the message of that last chapter is that if you want to opt out of this very corrupt system of theft and cronyism and corruption, well, there's an option for you. Um, you don't have to participate in that. And we don't need a political action committee to, um, you know, like get us back on the gold standard or whatever. We could just opt out to Bitcoin and that's it. And, uh, and you, don't, you don't have to necessarily, you know, um, participate in all of the different moral, uh, immoral things, um, you, know, uh, you know, living on debt and so on. Um, instead, you can you know, go with the principles that God gave us, like sowing and raping, like, um, you know, saving and spending after you save instead of before, which is what that is. Um, and getting yourself into a position where you can sort of think about the future a lot more and, um, you know, maybe think about having a bigger family or, you know, um, doing things that might impact God's kingdom in a way that you, um, you know, hadn't considered. And this is the thing is, uh, as long as you're in debt, you're always going to be thinking about that. Debt. <laughs> and how do, I, I don't know how many Christians have been essentially handcuffed by mortgages, right? Like, I, I suspect it's a lot. Um, and they, they work jobs that they don't like to, um, you know, do things that they don't want to do, because they're, they're chained to it. And it really is kind of a form of slavery. Uh, whereas, you know, if, if there is savings and God calls you to do something, well, now, now you're free to go try that, right? Like if he calls you into the mission field or, um, or whatever, you're not bound by a giant mortgage or, you know, your credit card debt or your student loans or whatever. Um, instead, you are free to do what God wants you to do instead of being bound by whatever fiat money has kind of enslaved you to um and that that i think ultimately will help us follow god a lot better were there any parts of the book that you thought uh you would have liked to have seen expanded on uh 
Um, I mean, I've had, uh, I, I mean, we, we went over this book many times, like as a group of authors. Um, so it, it's pretty well refined, I think. Um, and, you know, we did have some conflicts about, hey, we, should we put this in there? Should we put that in there? We ended up cutting a lot of it and things like that. Um, I, I think I would have uh, liked maybe talking about, um, you know, more of uh, the spiritual consequences of the current fiat system. Uh, I mean, we did certainly talk about it quite a bit, um, but there, there are aspects, especially um, politically, sort of like the, uh, you know, like I mentioned, like the whole narcissism thing. I, I would have like loved to have explored how fiat money has made us just way more narcissistic um, or, you know, sort of the modern diseases, psychological <laughs> diseases or um, you know, I, what I would call like sinful behavior that we're apt to and, you know, how, how that came about. Um, yeah, I, I would have loved to have uh, explored that a little bit. Um, there, there are also things that I've learned since uh, about fiat money and uh, sort of studying like sort of the fall of the Weimar Republic a little bit. Um, there, there is a tendency for sort of hyperinflating economies uh, for uh, for those to have uh, a uh, for a lot of the people to have a lot less reverence for tradition, for example, um, a lot less uh, you know reverence for their elders, um, a lot more sort of like uh, hedonistic behavior. Um, all, all of these things tend to come about as a result of inflation. Um, you know, even art tends to become a lot more abstract and less representational. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, things that tend to be very high time preference, if you will, a lot more fiat -y. Um And, you know, talking about that and uh, researching that and putting that into the book would have been great. Um, I do want to do like more of a theological work with uh, one of my co authors who's interested in this particular thing. So he's, uh, Jordan Bush, he's, uh, he's currently a missionary in uh, Uruguay, uh, and he, his congregation is like half Venezuelan. This is how he got interested in Bitcoin and so on. So, um, so he and I want to do something and like do a serious biblical study and make the biblical argument uh, for what, uh, for sound money, basically. Um, and you know, go go through what God says about money and how you know there there's so many verses about money, by the way. So there there's plenty plenty of material there. But um, coming up with like a, a strong theological base uh, and like arguing straight from scripture um, instead of just explaining things, uh, like uh, making it more of a proof book, I, I think is is of interest to us. I'd, I'd, I'd read it. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot more interest in that than we thought it would be. So, yeah. You know, even as you're like, think you're like um, talking about how like the, the inflation resulting in de mm -hmm. cultural degradation, you know, art degradation. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking like, man, that I, it's surprising to me that more conservatives haven't gotten into Bitcoin for that reason. Like for the reason of seeing mm -hmm. the way that fiat system does result in uh yeah do, you know it's that short-term thinking doesn't just apply to the future it applies to the past like I, who cares mm -hmm. what people did back then uh, you know i i want my i want my uh my iphone now you know it is kind of surprising and i i don't know maybe maybe conservatives will be more inclined to give bitcoin a second look because for them you know it's like dark net drug money or something and uh, and a vehicle for gambling and speculation which uh, honestly it can be sometimes but there there's a whole other side to it that we really hope to bring with this book to the community and say you know what you know money's a lot more than that and you're thinking of it in uh very shallow terms and there there are much bigger things afoot here i was wondering jimmy if you could expand for a moment you had a couple tweets recently about um one was things that used to impress me, but now don't. And then the other one was things that don't impress me, but now do. Um, could you just kind of expand on that concept? And is that at all related to Bitcoin? Or is that just 
or is that something that occurred, you know, um, in parallel, but not necessarily related? I would say that things that used to impress me are based on some sort of credentials or, um, you know, amount of money involved. And, and the thing is, like, in a free market economy with uh, sound money, I think that's actually a pretty good signal, right? Like, in a free market economy, someone's made a lot of money. That generally means that they provided a good or service to other people that was valued by a lot of people. In a sense, um, they are being honored for how much they've contributed to other people's lives um, through the fair exchange of, uh, you know, uh, favors in the future, which we call money. Um, But in a fiat money economy, this becomes a terrible signal um, and it becomes more of a... uh, an indicator of how close you are to the money printer. And I think a lot of these things that used to impress me were things that might have made money, uh, but were more because they were closer to the money printer. Um, So, you know, New York Times bestsellers, for example. Well, first of all, it's not even the bestsellers, right? It's uh, it's basically by the New York Times editorial board, and they, they decide what goes on there. It's not about sales at all, which is why... Certain books like Jordan Peterson's books don't make it on there, even though it's by any metric like top 10 in the, in the, uh, in the country or whatever. Uh, but they don't like Jordan Peterson, so he doesn't get to be on there. So um, it's, it's a way to manipulate the public. So it, it used to be more about you know, what, what's, what interesting new ideas are out there, but now it's become sort of like a propaganda arm. Um, you know, a lot of these like Facebook, Amazon, and, uh, you know, Apple and Netflix and Google, like all those companies, um, you know, I used to want to be one of those engineers as a coder. Uh, you know, I, I dreamed of being at those. But, you know, at this point, the, the way those companies are run and the censorship that they do and all of that, it's, um, I have no desire whatsoever. Uh, and I, I kind of see it as cringy for people to still be there. It used to be sort of like a marker of, hey, I've made it. Uh, now it's a marker of, hey, you're part of the system, you know? Um, and that's, that's not that impressive to me anymore. Um, uh, you know, degrees and, uh, you know, investment banking jobs and things like that, those, um, you know, those sit very close to the money printer. Uh, they're, they're heavily subsidized. Uh, the, the things that are opposite for me, um, I think I had sort of dismissed as, uh, as something that wasn't necessarily earned, uh, but, you know, getting older, I think I do realize that they're earned and they require a lot of hard work. So, uh, you know, non-mainstream opinions, like, uh, well-researched ones, like it, it takes some time to actually go and look through those and question conventional wisdom. That's actually quite rare these days because people are so afraid of holding them. Uh, You know, like physical strength or beauty, those are not things that come that easily. (laughs) Like you might have it for a little bit, uh, but unless you train for it and like really try to keep it up, um, neither of those are are free, right? Like they, they require a lot. Um, so I, I have a lot more respect for those. Um, anything with that that's lasted a long time, traditional stuff, um, or you know, old books or things like that. Um, you know, I have more respect for just because they've uh, lasted a long time. Like they, they're, uh, um, they weren't like whims of a particular generation or whatever. So. Yeah, um, and all all of that is uh, started, I think, with um, you know questioning money. Uh, you know, I, I have questioned a lot of things. You know, I'm I'm a carnivore. <laughs> I I uh, you know I I my my exercise regimen is uh, entirely based around powerlifting. Um, you know, I, I I do a lot of things that are very unconventional in part because. I, I realize that there's a lot of wisdom that isn't necessarily conventional. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the Bible backs me up on that. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's this, this funny thing that happens when you, like, you realize they're lying to you about something. Then you start being like, what else are they lying to me about? And, <laughs> and yeah, I, got, I, I think there's something to that. I think there's also something, like, what you're, like, what you're also saying, like, um, I don't know how often I've been like trying to ex- talk, like talking to someone who is just like, just watches the news. And I'm like, 
you know the world that Jesus told us not to to trust? That's them. You you know that, right? Like that's that's the world. That's those are them. Yeah, and yet there's uh there's, there's so many Christians that think being a rule follower is being Christian, and it's like that's uh, that's not what Jesus would do, man. All right, he, he, if he was a rule follower, he would have been a Pharisee, basically. But that's not how it is. But one more question. That's another hard uh, turn in a different direction. Uh, but it's just one I like to ask people. Um, what books are you reading right now? Just what are you consuming right now to learn stuff? Yeah, so um, I, I've recently gotten into First Things magazine. I don't know if you've read that, uh, but very, very good like articles, very well thought out, and um, not necessarily mainstream opinion, and like they back things up. Um, you know, just intellectually as a Christian, that that's probably one of my sat- more satisfying reads on a monthly basis. Um, and you know, like I, I'm not getting any endorsements from them. I just, I just enjoy it. Um, it's it's definitely not Christianity Today or something like that, which to me is is kind of cringe. Uh, I'm I'm reading a few books. Um, Age of Enlightenment is uh, is a book I'm in the middle of. Um, there's uh, there's Caesar and Christ, uh, just like getting the context around that period of history. Um, the guy's not a Christian though, so just just a warning if you get triggered by you know, sort of atheist uh, treatments of Jesus. I'm, re- I'm always reading, like, several books at once. So, yeah, uh, but, you know, all, all of them are very good. Um, oh, oh, On Dialogue, I'm, I'm reading that. Well, if you've, if you've got no other questions on your list, uh, I think uh, we're, we're about to the end of our time. Well, we're a little bit further. Once again, the rural Rothbard's going to be upset with us for going so long. Uh, but... Uh, Thank you so much for coming on, and we appreciate uh, your time. We appreciate you uh, talking to little old us. Um, yeah, it's appreciate a lot. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the chance to get to speak to your audience about this. Hopefully, they can understand a little bit more about um, you know how Bitcoin fits into their spiritual life. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Hey, it's the Rural Rothbard here. If you made it this far, then you obviously enjoy the same kind of things that we enjoy. So I'd encourage you to check out flyover.page. That's our website. As well as our mailing list that lets you know about new episodes. Uh, and all three of us on Twitter. At Darabelli, at Rural Rothbard, at Iowa Cap. Thank you. <laughs>